find that this second temptation is so much more sly and subtle and so much more tempting that uh, for good reason, I think Luke doesn't place the temptations in, in chronological order as Matthew does here, but instead Luke puts this temptation at the end because it's the slickest one. It's the most subtle one. It's the most, um, it's the most um, tricky and, and could most easily cause any one of us to slip up. And the nature of it is quite simple. If I want to give the game away here at the beginning, is that the nature of the second temptation is to question whether God has been good enough. Because based on that question and how that sits in your heart, whether God has been good enough, you can exercise either a fake trust in the Lord or a genuine trust in the Lord. So we want to see the difference between a fake trust and a real trust, and we want to, we want to understand what it means that God is good enough. First, we must get the setting of the second temptation, because this does not occur in the wilderness. Somehow, some way, the devil whisks Jesus into the holy city and to the pinnacle of the temple. We're not exactly how this happened again, but the language of the text suggests that Jesus is brought to a place called the pinnacle of the temple. Now, the holy city refers to Jerusalem. And the temple, of course, is that rebuilt temple from the days of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai that Herod had uh, beautified and added so much spectacle and glory to, beautiful stones and gold. It was a, a wonder of the world at the time of Jesus. The pinnacle of it, not exactly sure, but we assume that it would have been something like the spot where, and you can see this a little better if you see some of those maps of, uh, of, uh, of the temple in the back there, but there's a part of the temple that overlooks the Kidron Valley. And so uh, there's a spot where basically the height of the temple and the bottom of the Kidron Valley would have been something like 450 feet, a dizzying height that's, that's very, very, very high up. And certainly no one would be able to survive such a fall. Now, we need to understand here what the temple represented in order to, I think, see some of the irony and the temptation that Satan is offering with this second temptation. Again, if you remember from this morning, in 586 B.C., the Babylonians had come, conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, didn't leave even a stone on the other, and the people were exiled into Babylon and to all parts of the kingdom of Babylon, including men like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, and so on. Now, God also prophesied with this destruction and with this dispersion that he would bring them back into the land. If you remember when we were in Ezra, we talked all about that. And so they returned and they rebuilt Jerusalem, they rebuilt the temple, but of course there was no king. In fact, what would follow after the rebuilding of the city and the rebuilding of the temple is that the priesthood quickly fell into idolatry and corruption, as did the people. And following the rebuilding of the temple, we had, we had that 400 years of silence where no new prophets arose amongst the people. Well, what filled in that time? Well, Judaism as a religion, the temple, the land, the people, it all fell into the classic manipulations and machinations of man. Political wranglings, conspiracies, corruption, violence. It was just like the kind of thing you see on TV nowadays when you turn on the news about politics. All of that stuff that so characterizes people when they get together in groups, which should not have been true of God's holy people, it went on for 400 years. It's an awful time when you look at the history of it. Um, 
And it was just filled of the most secular and worldly kinds of activities by God's people. Now, by the time of Jesus, then, that temple represented almost everything wrong with the state of Jewish religion, of biblical Judaism. There's violence and worldliness. Again, the King Herod had refurbished and beautified this temple, but he was a bloody, violent man. There's hypocrisy and dishonest gain within the priesthood, buying and selling of positions, things of that nature. And all Jesus had was criticism and contempt for what had become the Old Testament law, the practice of the Old Testament covenantal system. And so he even prophesied the destruction of that temple towards the end of his ministry that there would be a judgment from God, and in 70 AD there was. The Romans uh, came against the Jewish people and against Jerusalem, and that temple was destroyed. And even to this day, 2,000 years later, what you see atop that mountain, that desolation, is a result of that destruction. Now, it wasn't that every person who worshipped there was wicked. Let me just say that. Or that there was no one who came to that temple and wasn't sincerely worshiping God. But they were justified back then as now by grace, through faith. Not by showing up and offering to the corrupt priests their money and their tithes and their offerings in this facade of, of a, a temple that was supposed to represent God's presence on earth, but instead had become this you know, display of the power of man. So in a way, it's perfect, it's the perfect spot for Satan to come and tempt Jesus because the temple represents Satan's successfulness in tempting the children of Adam and in tempting the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the perfect place because this is where for 400 years, in a way, Satan had had his way and had corrupted the Jewish people so that the place that used to be where God dwelt, where his presence was found, was now a monument to how efficiently man perverts anything holy. Perfect. So uh, Satan brings Jesus up to this high point of the temple, looking down into you know, 400 feet uh, of the Kidron Valley where there's just rocks and stones, a sure death sentence, and he offers what really does sound like a sensible temptation. And think about it like this. I know probably we're all conditioned to think this is the most ridiculous thing, and you do. You need a, you need a land on. This is a really ridiculous temptation. But if it's really overtly, ridiculously bad then is it really a temptation? It's like someone offering you, you know, at a lemonade stand, you know, this is arsenic. This will kill you immediately. But this is lemonade, and it may or may not have arsenic in it. So you know that you'd exactly avoid, you know, what, you know, the poison that's offered so obviously. But something that kind of looks tempting, that's the real temptation. So there's got to be some way in which this is actually tempting. Because if it's so obviously, horrendously the bad choice, it's not really hardly a temptation at all. Does that make sense? So what is sensible about this temptation? I think we need to understand. We need to make this something reasonable. So think about it like this. How sure is Jesus about his mission and his purpose? If he were to, for example, as a child, slip and fall from some cliff in Galilee as a youngster, surely he wouldn't die or couldn't die because he has to get to the cross, right? So there must be some kind of divine protection keeping him. I get a heart attack every day about what my kids do. Right? And, and really, it's the fragility of life is such that, and I'm sure you've heard stories from your friends of a child just for one split second, you don't watch him, and something terrible happens. But this is Jesus. So, you know, if, if he was on the, on the shores or on, on the beach in Galilee and a violent storm uh, comes up and then sweeps him away, he can't die that way, right? He has to die on the cross. So, Doesn't it make sense that God has to protect Jesus? And in fact, Satan offers scriptural support for the fact that 
Jesus must be supernaturally, let's say, protected. He, he quotes Psalm 91, which says, May, um, He will command his angels concerning you. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And, and that is essentially saying or gives you the image that if, if Jesus were to take a flying leap off the pinnacle, then angels would come and help his descent so that he would land softly or perhaps to bring him back up to the pinnacle of the temple. But either way, he shouldn't die. Now, what Satan is offering then is, is sort of a win-win situation all the way around. If you jump off the temple and you survive, wouldn't these corrupt priests and Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees, wouldn't they have to acknowledge that you are someone special, that you are perhaps even the Son of God and submit to you? Jesus could prove to Satan and the whole world that, that he is who he says he is. Wouldn't this validate God's message if you just jumped off of this and you did not die? It'd be incredible. You know what? Maybe, Jesus, you can make your point without even bothering with Gethsemane and the betrayal and the whipping and the crown of thorns and the crucifixion. Let me say right away again that nearly everything we said about last time about the first temptation applies to this temptation as well. At least one reason this is the wrong thing to do is simply it's not God's will that takes it off the table that this is not part of the plan for God's redemption of man. Um, But tonight I think we need to expand on what it is to be tempted to have a fake trust in the Lord. Now, I'm not trying to trivialize this, but I think most of you here have experienced or know what a trust fall is. Have you ever gone to camp, right? Or in, you know, middle school or elementary school and you put your hands at your side, okay, you close your eyes and you fall backward, maybe off a table or maybe just standing on the ground and you trust that someone behind you is going to catch you. So I I think most of you can imagine that if you haven't been in that scenario. Maybe you've been dropped by one of these. What is the point of a trust fall? It It is to answer the question, can you trust this person? Now this is like the trust fall to beat all other trust falls is it not it's it's funny actually when i was writing this i remembered that i had a friend in college I, he's a actually a friend in high school he's my friend in college he's a pastor now too and uh, this this made me remember that in college um he would do this thing where we'd all be standing like in a group talking and he would just do a trust fall and expect me to to come and get him now he's 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 taller than me uh he's he's more athletic than me so he weighed more but he would just basically just start tipping over and he would trusted me so much as his friend you know from high school that uh that i would go and catch him and, it, and i was thinking was i 100 percent? did i ever drop him and i want to say that uh, i never dropped him but when i say that he was trusting me he was not leaving any room to catch himself so he really legitimately, if, if I didn't do something, he was going to fall on his back or on his, on his face. And again, that's just you know how much he trusted me as a friend. But you can imagine that there's no way that any of us could be 100% for the rest of your lives on something like that. The question is, what if God were your trust partner? Is he not going to be 100%? And that's the angle that Satan is trying to work here in this passage from Psalms. He's saying, don't you trust God? You do trust God. You're the son of God, right? You trust him with your life. If you're the son of God, you must believe him when he says, I will command his angels concerning you on their hands. They'll bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Prove you believe God in his word. Jump and show the world that God is 100% faithful and that you're his son. That does not that seem somewhat logical. Does not that seem a little bit sensible? After all, do you not trust God's word? So what is wrong with that? Why is that so troublesome? I don't think there's anything explicitly on the surface of it wrong with that request. Satan is challenging Jesus, it sounds like, to have faith in God. So how could that be 
bad. Well, let's look at Psalm 91. Let's turn there and get the context. Because you know if Satan is quoting Scripture, you can be almost 100% sure he's quoting it out of context. Psalm chapter 91. You can actually get the whole theme of the psalm just there in verse 1. Or 1 and 2, I should say. Psalm 91, 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to Yahweh, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. So Psalm 91 is a psalm of acknowledging that God is a shelter and I can trust Him to protect me. And everything flows from that, just examples of that. Go down now to verse 9. Because you have made Yahweh your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent, for He will command His angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now notice, of course, that Satan kept out that to guard you in all your ways. In other words, the purpose of those angels is to guard those who are doing the will of God. But he, he kind of left that out. But let's demonstrate the subtle angle of this temptations and why it is so dangerous. Satan is much more sophisticated here in this second temptation. And let's, let's again say it like this. Is there a way that you can trust God but not really trust God? And the answer is yes. When you presume upon God in order to force your will to be God's will. There is a way to say you trust God, but not really trust Him when you presume upon God in order to make your will His will. Look again at Psalm 91. Look actually at verse 13. You will tread on the lion and the adder. The young lion and the serpent you will trample under foot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. Now, is this passage saying that as an expression of your trust, your full-blown trust in God, that you should book yourself a flight to Africa? Sign up for a safari. Get out of the jeep and just start stomping on the head of every lion and deadly snake in Africa. Would, would that, is that what this passage is saying? That if you did that, God is going to protect you. And look, God is going to show everybody that He's protecting you, that He loves you. Because you really, really trust Him that He's going to do that. Or would that be a sinful presumption on your part? Now all the other verses there have the same kind of angle to them, including verse 9 and 12. Is this saying then, by the same logic, that rather than take elevators to the bottom floor, that you should now, as a regular practice of your trust in God, every time you're in a two-store building or above, you just jump out the window to get to your car. Because, hey, the angels have been commanded concerning you that your foot will not even strike a stone. You'll be safe in the arms of the angels. Well, no. I, I mean, if, if we're saying that this is not advocating that we go stomp on every single lion and, and deadly snake we see, this is also saying don't just go leaping off of every two-story building. Because you trust God. Instead, that would be exactly <coughs> testing the Lord. The intent of this passage <coughs> excuse me, is not that you need to go and put yourself in harm's way in all of the ways this passage is talking about so that God can show to the world that He is a refuge and that He is a shelter. And that's exactly what Satan is trying to tempt Jesus to. There's certain irony that this passage cannot be teaching that, but that is what Satan is using this passage to teach. That would be using the phrase, I trust God, to mean I'm going to force God to do something for me. Again, the idea is 
that we would be trying to presume upon God in order to force your will to be God's will. Now we have to understand then, well, that's what this psalm does sound like it's saying very explicitly though. I mean, can, can we, if it doesn't mean that, then what, what does it mean? Because in a way, if you think about it, there's plenty of godly men and women who have died in exactly the ways that the psalmist here says God will protect them. In the first century, those early believers, they were fed to lions for spectacle and sport during the time of Nero and other emperors. What happened? I thought I was going to tread on those lions, that I would be the one trampling them underfoot, that God would deliver me and protect me because I, I know his name. What's going on there then? This is, you know, is it something worse, actually, that God does not keep his promises and therefore you cannot trust him well the lord has delivered his people in some of these ways you think of daniel he did preserve daniel in den of lions even in recent history the lord has saved his people out of many many dire and desperate circumstances so these are the many these are examples of the many ways that god has protected believers throughout history but not because they were intentionally putting themselves in dangerous situations. Instead, as God's will brought them to temptation, or to trial, I should say, in tribulation, God's will also brought them through it. And all that God's people have been concerned with is not testing the Lord, but obeying the Lord. Remember, it is the food of Jesus to the will of the one who sent him. As Jesus did the will of God, surely trials and, would come. Surely tribulation and desperate situations would come. And God would be the one that would have to deliver him because God is the one that put him through it. And that's true of every believer. Now these faithful men and women, like the psalmist here, they didn't try to presume their will to be God's will or force God's hand to rescue them in order to prove that God was good, but they just found themselves in those situations because they already believed and trusted that God is good and were walking in obedient trust. And actually that's what Psalm 91 is focusing on. It's that if you trust God, if you believe Him, if you hold fast to Him, then everything else will work out. God will be good. And He will, at times, bring you out of those situations as His will declares. But God doesn't always protect. Because it even says here that no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. But you'd have to be extraordinarily naive to think that what the psalmist means by that is that not ever once in your whole life as a Christian will you ever even come close to the taint of wickedness and sin. Because for one thing, you're still a sinner. But for another thing, we live in a sin-cursed world. So there's no way that he, he was thinking that no evil ever befalls the godly. Instead, what this passage is saying this is a, now the Yuri paraphrase edition. This is saying, you are invincible in the Lord's purposes when you trust God enough to obey God. That you, nothing can stop you, nothing can harm you, nothing can hurt you as you do God's will and do His purpose. And when His purpose for you is finished, then He will take you home at His priority at his timetable whether that's at the mouth of a lion or in a fire or at home peacefully or whatever the case might be at the hands of your enemy all things that have happened to believers but until that end you are invincible to do god's will nothing can stop you as you trust god enough to obey him jesus knows that the will of god is to bring him to the cross not the pinnacle of the temple not the bottom of the Kidron Valley. He trusts God enough to do His will. He wouldn't dare presume to make His will God's will, just like in Gethsemane. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. 
The irony in Satan using this passage to tempt Jesus is that to take it in the sense of, so go do this, act presumptuously, would be contrary to the intent of the passage. Because that is not how you show trust in God. You should trust in God by running to Him. By trusting Him. By doing His will as faithfully as you can. And you let the Lord fight your battles for you. So there is a way to seem like you're trusting God and His Word, but not really. Because the end goal is is to selfishly impose your will upon God's. Twisting Scripture to make God's will my will. A couple applications then, or some practical examples. I don't know if I'm going to get to the second half of this message, but I'll try. There is a way then that you can understand God's will or God's word, I should say, in such a way that you still go contrary to His will, and that you end up testing Him because you seem to be applying Scripture and trusting Him, but really, you're twisting Scripture to make God's will your will. And again, this is... uh, We want to be careful that we don't misuse Scripture to convince ourselves that God wants me to do that terrible thing that I just really want to do. For example, this is a very simple one. It's not as as bad, but uh, Philippians 4.13, what's it say? I can do all things through Him, through Jesus, who strengthens me. Now, twisting this verse, you can literally make that say that God has made it possible for you to do anything. You twist that verse a little bit, and you can use this to justify stealing from your boss. You can use this to justify cheating on your spouse. You can use this to do all sorts of things. God, I can do all things. And all things means all things, doesn't it, Pastor Yuri? Well, we'll get to that in a second. We can do this. Another example is uh, the idea of grace. Ephesians 1.7 uh, says... Ephesians 1, 7. In, we, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 1, 7 then says that you, by grace all of your sins are forgiven. Past, present, future. So, wouldn't it be very trusting of me to go and, and, and do this sin and know that God has forgiven it already. I mean, that's very trusting, isn't it? Like, I, I know, I know this is really bad, um, but I really want to do it. And, you know, I know that God in His grace is going to forgive me. I mean, you're right, but you're not right. <laughs> Just like Satan was. You're right that God's grace has forgiven your sins, past, present, future. It's incredible to think about that. But you're not right that the implication of that is you're really trusting God when you sin. <clears throat> so to avoid that situation where you might twist God's word to seem like you're trusting him when you're really not, is we must really understand God's word and his will. We need to follow the, the pattern of tonight, like understanding the context of a passage like Psalm 91 and other passages of Scripture um, that are related to the subject. Jesus is going to quote Deuteronomy 6.6. 6. But, for example, in the case of Philippians 4.13, the near context tells you that this is not about being enabled to do whatever you want to do. Paul says that in the very clear context of dealing with hardship and having nothing. He's writing from prison, and he's essentially saying, I can endure even having nothing, even all my friends betraying me, having no possessions, because Christ is the one who strengthens me. Far cry from thinking that God is going to enable you to do whatever it is you want to do, good or bad. Or in the, uh, in the case of mis- misunderstanding Ephesians 1.7, it needs to be understood in the light of other passages like Romans chapter 6. Where Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
We are buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So that if you have truly been saved by grace, your, your view of sin is not that which has been forgiven so I can do, but that which is dead to me now because I have a new life in Christ. So the passages of Scripture. We need to essentially remember the garden. See, Satan's tactics are not new. His temptations have always followed a similar vein of twisting God's words and trying to use them to deceive and tempt us. Didn't God say, and quoting scripture that's taken out of context to manipulate Jesus, is just the flip side of Satan telling Eve in the garden. Did God actually say you can't eat of any tree in the garden? Just sowing doubt about what God actually said which is the same thing as misquoting a text in order to mislead. We want to remember also that we tempt ourselves in this way. It's not just that Satan tempts us to, to take the Word of God slightly out of context or to justify why we want to do what we want to do when you're arguing with your wife about something, some decision you want to make, and you start whipping out scriptures to beat her or him over the head with it. That is to fall into this temptation, to try and use God's word and his goodness and his promises to make your will his will, to force his hand. We'll get, we'll, we, can, we can finish this up. We can finish this up. Now, Jesus' response to this temptation is to say, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Here, Jesus again used scripture to counter the devil and his temptation. And this time he quotes from Deuteronomy 6.16. If you want to turn there, it's the fifth book of the Bible, Deuteronomy 6.16. Up front, as you're turning there, I want to say that testing God, the way that Jesus is using the term testing, you should not test the Lord your God, it's not quite the same way as when Gideon tested God. Famously in Judges 6, 36 through 40, um, he, he did the fleece thing, if you remember that. Um, if you really want me to go and defeat the Midianites, then you're going to make the fleece wet and the ground dry, and then he, you know, make the, the ground dry and the fleece wet, and he tested the Lord in doing this. But here, at least, it's very clear, Gideon was straight up afraid, <laughs> and he was reluctant to believe God, just unbelief. God was gracious to let Gideon test him multiple times, actually not just with with the fleece, but the whole story begins sort of with Gideon being very reluctant about obeying the Lord. But uh, he was always a fearful man, actually. But this wasn't necessarily rebellion or unfaithfulness per se, not the kind of testing that Jesus is talking about here. That was just because he, you know, I, I think God just knew he needed that encouragement that he's dealing with a faithful or a fearful man that just needed to be affirmed and assured. The kind of testing that Jesus is uh, speaking against is, is different, and we'll, we'll unpack that in just a moment. Deuteronomy 6.16 comes after what's called the Shema, O hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. The people of um, that had escaped from Egypt, or not escaped, but were freed by God in Egypt, um, that whole generation had died in the wilderness because of their unfaithfulness to the Lord. And now their children are here on the cusp of entering into the promised land. And Deuteronomy literally means second law. In other words, they are being reminded again of what the Lord requires. And Deuteronomy 6.16 essentially reminds them of how faithful and good God has been to them through Egypt, through the wilderness, and how He will be faithful to them when they enter into the promised land. Deuteronomy 6.16 then coming after that says, you shall not put Yahweh your God to the test as you tested him in Masa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of Yahweh your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of Yahweh that it may go well with you 
and that you may go in and take possession of the good land that Yahweh swore to give to your fathers by thrusting out all your enemies from before you as Yahweh has promised. Deuteronomy 6.16 then is, is basically saying, don't, when, when he says don't test Yahweh, it's really saying don't repay God's goodness with testing, with unbelief, with disobedience. Don't repay God's goodness past, present, and future by not trusting in Him enough to obey Him. In other words, what is the correct response to having a good and faithful God? It's to trust, not test. And really, this is what Psalm 91 is saying as well, that God is good, He's done good, and He can be trusted fully. Deuteronomy 6.16 references Masa. Now this is the place uh, where Moses was uh, in the wilderness with that first generation of Israelites and they're wandering in the wilderness and they're, they're dying of thirst and they come to a rock and the people start to complain, why would you bring us out here just to die? Why has God done this? And uh, Moses comes to God and says, what is this people <laughs> that you have given to me? And God graciously brings water out of the rock when Moses uh, speaks to it. And he calls that place Masa uh, and Meribah because they're super bitter <laughs> about what God had done. They're very ungrateful and unloving and untrusting. And that's really the heart of testing. Ex- Exodus 17, which is where that story comes from, it ends with this question that was on the heart of the Israelites, that was the prompting their testing of the Lord in Masa. It says, Is Yahweh among us or not? Exodus seventeen seven, And that's the heart of it right there. The opposite of trusting God isn't not trusting God or disbelieving God. It's something worse. The heart of testing God is to presume upon his goodness to meet your own selfish desire. You see, these people, they knew that God was a good God because he'd saved them out of Egypt. They'd have to be blind and, and dumb to not understand that God is good. But see, God isn't good unless I'm getting what I want. That's what happened. Is Yahweh even among us if I'm not getting what I want? Because I know he's really good and trustworthy, so why can't he do this thing for me? And that's what turns it into such a diabolical scheme and temptation. We test the Lord when we have the audacity to question His goodness and then presume upon His goodness for our own ends, for our own will. You imagine a child, Christmas morning, surrounded by every kind of gift and presents, wrapping paper up to the ceiling, there's horses there, every, everything. Presents are generous. The parents are wanting to please the child. And there's lavish expenses everywhere. No room for want. And then these words come from the child's lips. Is this it? That, in that moment, just that that selfishness, entitlement, egotism, that is the heart of testing the Lord. When a child does that to someone who's clearly been good to them, it's, it's just ungrateful and rude. But when we question the goodness of God and then try to appeal to His goodness and His kindness to try and get more of what we want, that's satanic. That is to test the Lord, to deceive ourselves into thinking that God can be manipulated by appealing to His own character as a good God. Are you really good? Because... Why, why aren't things going my way? For Jesus to leap off the pinnacle to see if God would be good to his word wouldn't have been a leap of faith, but a leap of accusation, saying, you haven't done enough good for me yet, God. Prove that you're so good and give me what you said you'd give me. Jesus conquered this temptation. How? By knowing that God is good. You don't need to test God if you know God is good. You don't need to test a battery if you just bought it off the shelf and you know it's good. Well, ideally, 
<laughs> I've had a lot of car battery trouble, so I think I shared that with you guys not too long ago. But presumably, you buy something new, you don't need to test it, you already know it's good. Because it just came off the shelf, it's not second hand. Jesus did not need to test God because he was already very, very confident that God had been good to him. And of course, as the Son of God, he knew the goodness of God. So the second temptation, the one that we want to look out for in our own life, is in what ways are we accusing God of not doing enough good to warrant our complete trust? And this comes out in a lot of ways. You need to think about this for yourself. But complaining is one of those ways that we are subtly saying, you know, if God was really good, He would change the circumstance. It comes out in legalism. You know, I've done a lot of good, and if God's really good, he would repay that. I mean, he blesses, right? It comes out when we, uh, when we mistreat others, try to manipulate other people to do what we want. Because saying, God isn't good enough to get this for me, so I need to do something for myself. And in all of these things, we're making this subtle claim that God has not done enough good for us to trust Him. How do we know that God is good? So that we don't have to be tempted with this thought. That maybe, just maybe, you know, I can, I can twist God, hold Him accountable to His own word, and, and slyly get what I want. Romans 8.32 should make it clear to us. There should be no question that God is good, that we ever have to question that that God has done enough to earn our trust. Romans 8.32, and you already know this verse. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You see, we know God is good because He's already given us His all, His best, His own Son. Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners, fully perfect, tempted in every way without sin, and yet He willingly endured the shame and the pain of the cross in order to reconcile us to Himself. And if that is not good enough for you to defy the temptation to try and manipulate God into doing this or that, then I fear that you do not understand the gospel and the sacrifice that Jesus made. You don't understand either who He is or you don't understand the depths of your sin. We would not ask for one thing more if we truly understood the depths of our offense towards God and the forgiveness that's been made on our behalf through Christ's blood. You wouldn't ask for one more thing in this life and you'd be totally content and happy. John Flavel says, how, in regards to Romans 8.32, he says, how is it imaginable that God should withhold after this spirituals or temporals from His people. How shall He not call them effectually, justify them freely, sanctify them thoroughly, and glorify them eternally? How shall He not clothe them, feed them, protect and deliver them? Surely if He would not spare His own Son, one stroke, one tear, one groan, one sigh, one circumstance of misery, it can never be imagined that ever He should, after this, deny or withhold from his people for whose sakes all this was suffered any mercies any comforts any privilege spiritual or temporal which is good for them which is good for them where we lack in our understanding of this temptation is we don't know what is good because sometimes it is good for you to be besieged by foes on every side, for your body to deteriorate and wear away, for you to lose your job, for you to be forsaken by someone close, for you to go through a a terrible divorce. All of these things, and they seem really bad on the surface of it, but God in His sovereignty, He intends those things for good. 
And we know that he can use horrible, wicked, sinful acts for good. Why? Because his son was murdered, suffered a horrible, disgusting, sinful, wicked, evil event. And yet from that, God did the ultimate good in redeeming us for himself. So can we not trust that he is good when things come our way that we don't necessarily want? Our understanding of good has to be conformed to God, understanding that God is good and trusting that and knowing that because Christ himself embodies that goodness. We cannot manipulate God to get what we want. We cannot bend his will to be our will. We cannot twist the scriptures to make that happen. We ought not to be tempted by that. And we, not ever, we should not ever say, God, you have not been good enough. And so let us, in the spirit of these verses then, and understand the example of our Lord, try to search out in our own hearts, have we been succumbing to this subtle deception, this temptation of Satan in our flesh, that maybe we can get God to do what we want if we just kind of use his own character against him. Maybe we can get something more good out of God or what we think is good out of God if we can just define it a certain way. Instead, we must be like Jesus to be totally content and happy and satisfied in his Father that nothing that the world or the devil or our flesh could offer us would ever, ever uh, even hold a candle to how good and generous God has been through Christ. And so may Christ be magnified in our lives. May our sin be so, so dark and, and sinister that to think that Jesus would forgive them is just the greatest gift from which there's nothing more to add. Everything else is just, that's nice. You know, hot tub on Christmas morning, that's nice. New car. Right for your birthday, that's nice. But compared to Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection, that's nice. But I know God is good because he has not withheld from me the greatest good, his own son. Now, if you're not a Christian, I think we said this last time, you are, you're simply at the whim of your temptations. I know many non-Christians who don't even believe in God who are constantly trying to manipulate God, to twist them to do what they want. They don't put it that way, but that's what they're doing. They, they bounce around uh, from this idol to that idol, trying to get what they want from life. Trying to subtly say, well, if there's a God, then uh, he, doesn't He want good for me? But you must come to God, God's way. You cannot manipulate God or strike a better deal with God than what He has offered, that you'd come to Him with your sin and your filthy rags of unrighteousness. And if you come in humility, He will give you a white robe. He will give you adoption. He will bring you to Himself if you would humbly come and accept His offer of grace through Jesus Christ to turn away from from uh, your, your pursuit of sin and self-satisfaction. Instead, find satisfaction in, in God because He's the one who made you. He knows how to make you happy. So if you're not a Christian this evening, I'd urge you to consider um, that you must come to God on His terms. You must come to God according to His will and His purpose. You are not anywhere close to being able to strike deals with Him. And so come and talk to me afterwards. I'd love to share more with you about that. Heavenly Father, thank you for, again, the example of Christ. So much more could always be said, and there's so many ways in which this uh, temptation in particular just holds so many uh, nuggets of of wisdom and facets into uh, our our dark hearts and deceitful hearts, uh, also as well into how Satan operates in subtly twisting the Word of God. But we thank You, Lord, that You have given us truth and You've given us of Your Spirit, that we can read Your Word and understand what it means, that You've given us a church and and people who love You to to be also fellow uh, co-workers and co-laborers and understanding and applying the Scriptures. Thank You, Lord, for uh, all of the means of grace that You give, prayer, Lord, and, um, and all of uh, the many uh, signs and evidences of your goodness, reflections of Jesus Christ and his gospel, even in every relationship here that is uh, in the name of Christ. So we thank you for that. How could we ever question your goodness? Why would we ever wonder whether you are among us 
when you have given us so many reasons to believe and trust you and let you hold us um, and carry us through all doing all of your will until you call us home, that we are invincible until uh, you are done in your purposes for us. So help us to truly trust you, not to fake trust you. Help us to truly understand your word and to apply it. Help us to not question whether you are good because we have seen and, and heard Christ and know what he has done for us. And so in his name we pray. Amen.